Hello and welcome to part 2 in my series of videos this week where I'll be breaking down all the fights taking place this weekend at UFC London from a betting perspective. Now I've already covered 3 fights this week in part 1 of this video which I will link to in the description below and I've already covered the main event fight between Darren Till and Jorge Masvidal so if you're interested in how I see that fight playing out from a betting perspective click the link in the description below to watch part 1 and check that out but I also want to add a little bit to my research Search from that fight uh, and show you something that I discovered today so earlier on the day Caroline Pierce she is a journalist that does a lot of work for BT Sport and this video is very quick it's only 12 seconds long but she posted this video uh, earlier on today at it was 12:43 uh, p.m. UK time which was around about uh, call it an hour and 45 minutes ago so very very recent video that's been posted and just check this out guys so i'll leave it play just look at how bad darren till looks already very dehydrated face very sucked in not looking good at all there obviously going through a brutal weight cut at the moment does not look good at all i'll replay it one last time just very quick but take a look at darren till guys not looking healthy at all um looks to be going through a brutal weight cut and the most scary thing about this video for me is that at time of recording this video, it's 2.30 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday, you know, the Wednesday before the event. So there's still three days to go before the event and already Darren Till is looking this bad. So where we, you know, spoke in the breakdown for that, that video, uh, sorry, the breakdown for that fight that, you know, Darren Till's weight cut is a huge issue. It's very difficult for him. And his cardio has looked quite suspect in the past in his fights against Velikovic, Ayari, and also Nicholas Dalby. You know, already three days before he's due to weigh in, he's looking dreadful. Um, which means the more of this kind of stuff I see, the more I am inclined to roll in the dice and taking a little bet on Jorge Masvidal. Also, as predicted in, in part one of the video, because Darren Till is a very hyped up fighter, a very popular fighter, uh, we are seeing money come in on him on some sites. You know, his odds have declined on the biggest uh, American betting website, which is Five Dimes, which has seen Jorge Masvidal's odds improve to 3.20. So, you know, even since you know, part one of this video, which came out a couple of days ago, Masvidal's odds are improving and getting down to the uh, implied probability of 30%, which is even more attractive than where they are, uh, you know, in the odds of 3.0 that we covered in the video, which gave him, it gave him an implied probability of 33%. So throughout the week, you know, I'll continue to cover this main event fight. There's a lot of interest in it, but that video from Darren Till from like two hours ago is not looking good at all. Very, very... Uh, sucked out, drawn in, dehydrated face. It's a terrible sign for Darren Till uh, with still two, three days to go before weighing in. But enough of that, guys. Um, before we get into the three fights there, I also want to remind you that I will be doing this bonus live stream on Saturday, a few hours before the event starts at 1 p.m. British time. So that's roughly around three to four hours before the event starts. It's scheduled in. Uh, I will be answering all your questions from the live chat about the fights taking place this weekend. I will also be trying to hunt for a decent value prop bet for every single fight taking place this weekend. If you don't know where a prop bet is, I can't even show you because none of them have been released yet, which is really annoying. But um, yeah, if you want to see that video, guys, this live stream on Saturday, hit the thumbs up and below. And if this video and every other video that I put out this week gets at least 50 likes, I will do that video. But now... Enough of that, let's jump into today's fights that I want to cover. And the first fight that I want to talk about is one that I've seen quite a lot of interest in, to be honest with you, online, which is something that I didn't expect. Uh, people, I've seen quite a lot of people talk about betting Ian Heinzish in this fight, which is interesting. If we look at his odds, the odds have also declined quite significantly since the weekend. He was around about a 2.36 underdog, now down to around about an average of 2.20. So a decent bit of money's coming on high niche. And to be honest with you, I was quite surprised when I was, you know, messing around on Twitter. So, you know, quite a lot of people betting this guy because there's no doubt when you research this fight, there's just no doubt that from a technical point of view, Tom Breeze is significantly better than him everywhere. If you go and watch any of Heinrich's fights, uh, you know, say this fight against Cesar Ferrara, this fight against Marcus Perez, this fight against Justin Sumter, 
you'll see that Heinish's biggest weakness is that his takedown defense is very poor. He's very easy to get to the ground, which is obviously a bit of an issue in a matchup like this because Tom Breeze is a very strong wrestler. You know, if Tom Breeze came in with a really grapple heavy game plan, took Heinish to the ground, looked to establish top position, control him from top position, this should theoretically be an easy night's work for Tom Breeze. You know, Breeze is a guy that prides himself on his grappling. He's competed in, you know, high level grappling tournaments like the EBI, you know, Eddie, Eddie Bravo Invitational tournaments. When it comes to wrestling and the ground game, these guys are in a completely different league. Um, I've also noticed that not only does Heinish give up very easy takedowns, but he's also very low level on the ground. He's very scrappy, he doesn't really protect himself that well, and tries to just do everything with heart and aggression as opposed to the correct technique. So this is a very good stylistic matchup for Tom Breeze, and obviously he's got home advantage on his side. You know, competing in the UK uh, in front of his, his own fans, is going to be massive if this this fight ends up being close. Chances are the judges would give him the nod. The only problem I have with Tom Breeze, really, um, I guess there's a couple of issues I have, but one issue I have with Tom Breeze is that even though he's a strong wrestler and he um, he has a very solid ground game, he doesn't really shoot that many takedowns. Um, and that could be because he's worried about his cardio conditioning. He doesn't really want to commit too many energy to takedowns. So he, he, you know, he paces himself throughout the fight and only goes for one or two takedowns per fight. Uh, but uh, sorry, what? Yeah, one or two takedowns per fight, really. Yeah, he doesn't even really go for one or two takedowns per round, which is a concern because obviously, Heinish is very scrappy, is very tough, is very aggressive, and even though Tom Breeze isn't, you know isn't uh even though tom breeze is a better technical striker he's got much better technique i feel heinish could outwork him just by being scrappy and tough and aggressive so really the easiest part of victory for breeze is to take heinish down and grind him out but the fact that he doesn't shoot that many takedowns per fight isn't really a good sign um also what i would say about this fight is that Breeze does have a decent size advantage. You know, he's six foot three compared to Heinish, who, in terms of wingspan, is quite small for a middleweight at five foot eleven. However, one of the reasons why you only really see Tom Breeze go for one or two takedowns per fight, despite being such a strong grappler on the ground, is because he is so tall that his offensive wrestling isn't great. He really struggles to get in deep on his opponent's hips. And for that reason, um, you know, I think that could be one of the reasons why he doesn't go for that many takedowns because he knows that his success rate's quite low. He's not the strongest offensive wrestler. He's great on the ground, very skilled grappler, but not great at getting it, getting his opponents to the ground. Although you wouldn't really have to try that hard to get Heinish to the ground because, like I say, Heinish's takedown defense is very, very poor. So... What I would also say an issue is that I have with Tom Breeze is that for whatever reason he seems to hold back and this is one of the problems that I do see with fighters that go and train at, at TriStar from a young age. Now just for the purposes of this video Breeze is no longer training in Canada in the Farasa Habi uh, with TriStar but sometimes I feel like when you get a young hungry aggressive fighter like Tom Breeze go and train a TriStar so early on in their career, a lot of the time it can overwhelm them and you actually see their, their career go backwards a little bit. Because if we look at when Tom Breeze first came into the UFC, before he was training a tri TriStar, when he fought guys like Luis Dutra and Katal Pendred, he was an absolute warrior. He was a wrecking machine, very aggressive, very technical. He just bl completely blew through these guys. And since then, since moving over to, to, to TriStar, you know, in the Nakamura fight, in the Strickland fight, he looked quite passive, looked to be holding back. And I think that's, you know, obviously this is just pure speculation, but it's something that I've observed over the years is when, when you get these fighters at a young age, an early stage in their career, go and train at TriStar, it's almost like they get overwhelmed by game plans and strategy and new techniques that they kind of just freeze up. And it means that they don't really have the same fire or aggression. They don't really let it go like they used to. They don't fight in, they don't fight in a way, or they don't do 
what got them to the dance in the first place, which means they kind of go back a little bit. And I've no doubt that, you know, Farah Sahabi is an amazing trainer, Tristar is an amazing gym, that over time, if they stay at that camp, it will be beneficial long term because, you know, they'll have what made them great at the beginning. Then they'll add all these new skills into the mix, all the new tactics and game planning that Zahabi brings into the mix. But initially, it can be a bad thing. So that's one issue I have with Breeze. Even though he's not training at TriStar anymore, you know, he's way more tactical now, holds back a little bit, he's a little bit passive, and that can get you into trouble when you're fighting against someone like Heinish, who doesn't have the same level of technique as you, but they are willing to out-hustle you and work you, and, uh, and they're really scrappy. So that's just something to think about. But what I will also say about Tom Breeze is that, like I say, he was young when he went and trained at TriStar. I believe he was only 24, 25. And he's still only 27 years old. It feels like he's been around for a long time. You know, that Katal Pendrid fight seems like, you know, light years ago now. It seems like a very long time ago. Um, but he is only 27 years old, which means we'd, we'd still expect him to be making significant improvements from fight to fight. And in a matchup like this, where, you know, he does have all that tactical game plan training under TriStar and now he's back in the UK training with you know the, the guys that he was he, he started out with are we going to see a situation where Breeze shows up on Saturday with the best of both worlds you know the tactics and the strategy from TriStar and the raw aggression that, that got him to the dance in the first place and will he blow through Heinish because there is no doubt that he is significantly better than Heinish from a technical point of view in every single aspect of MMA it's only really his pacing and sometimes his passive fighting style that makes me think Heinish has got a chance here if I could rely on Breeze to show up and perform to his full potential and let it go and fight at a high pace of 15 minutes, Breeze would be one of the best bets on this card. But based on his performances against Strickland and Nakamura, you know, we can't, we can't really, uh, we can't really trust him to do that. So if we look at the odds on this fight, currently we've got Ian Heinish at around about an average of 2.20, giving him an implied probability of 45%. And then if we look at Tom Breeze, his odds currently are improving on some sites, but at an average of around 1.71, giving him an implied probability of 58%. So what I would say about this fight, guys, is I do believe Breeze should be the favourite here. Like I say, he, from a technical point of view, he is significantly better than uh, Heinish in every single aspect of MMA. So I definitely wouldn't consider betting Heinish in this fight because he is second best everywhere and his takedown defense is really, really poor. If Breeze comes in with an intelligent game plan, just takes Heinish down, looks to grind him out for three rounds, this is going to be an easy night's work for Breeze. However, because of his passive performances against Strickland and Nakamura where he really didn't go up a gear, you know, he lost the split decision to Strickland because it was quite obvious the rounds were close, but he just chose not to go up a gear. He just didn't raise his game, raise his output for whatever reason and uh, and just just lost a really close fight. I hate fighters that do that. I'd prefer to see, you know, fighters that go out on their shield and and really, really commit a lot of energy to try and put in their stamp on rounds and Breeze doesn't really do that he used to back when he first came into the UFC but like I say that has escaped him over the last couple of years so that is the only reason why I don't recommend a bet on Breeze as a favorite and an implied probability of around about 68 percent because to get any value here you'd have to cap Breeze at you know 65 to 70 percent chance of winning this fight which is a bit steep because Heinish is very scrappy and uh, there's no quitting him but, you know, if Breeze's odds improve closer to around evens, 1.80, 1.90, could be worth a bet. But at the moment, for me, it is a pass, guys. So now we go on to the next fight, which is going to be another one that I've heard a lot of people talk about this week. Uh, and it's Dominic Reyes against Vulcan Ozdemir. Now, Vol uh, Dominic Reyes was one of the first names that jumped out at me when I began to research this card. Because I think he's an excellent fighter and it is about time that he got given a big fight. Now, I'm not saying Vulcan Ozdemir is a huge name. But Ozdemir, you know, has recently fought for a title, has recently lost to a guy that just fought for the title. So even though I don't personally believe Vulcan Ozdemir in terms of skill belongs in the top five, his name is floated around the top five because of, you know, his fast rise to the top and the guys that he's recently fought. And those are the kind of guys that Dominic Reyes should be fighting because in my opinion, 
Dominic Reyes is a top five light heavyweight. He's definitely one of the best light heavyweights in the world. He's an excellent fighter. He's excellent at everything. And over the last few years, we've seen guys like Vulcan Ozdemir. Um, we've seen guys like Johnny Walker. You know, we've even seen guys like Anthony Smith get a lot of hype in the light heavyweight division. And in my opinion, Dominic Reyes is significantly better than those three guys. You know, Ozdemir and Smith over the last couple of years have had a fast rise to the top. Whereas I feel Dominic Reyes has been slow rolled, you know, they've taken their time with him, which isn't a bad thing. But guys like Ozdemir and Smith, who are at a much lower level than Reyes, have been getting a lot of hype, a lot of promotion. And I don't feel like they, they have the skills to back it up, whereas I feel like Reyes does. And we're seeing a similar thing at the moment with Johnny Walker. I do feel like Reyes is significantly better than Johnny Walker. And yet Walker, at the, at the moment, is the guy that everyone in the MMA media is talking about. So... Really nice to see Dominic Reyes finally get a big name, big name, I guess. And hopefully this win will put him one step closer to maybe going into a, you know, a title elimination bout, something like that, to fight for the title, because I definitely think he's good enough. So, if we, uh, you know, match these guys up, study this fight from a betting perspective, again, there is no doubt in my mind that Dominic Reyes is significantly better than Vulcan Ozdemir everywhere. There is just absolutely no doubt about it. Reyes is an excellent striker, very technical striker, good boxing, KO power in every kick. He's, you know, absolutely ruthless when it comes to striking. One of the most dangerous strikers in the light heavyweight division because of how technical he is. You know, Johnny Walker's explosive and he's got knockout power, but he's also very reckless. And that recklessness will get him into trouble as he starts to face a higher level of opponent. Same with Vulcan Ozdemir, vicious knockout power, but then you start to get fanned out as you reach a higher level of opponent because these guys have the power, but they don't have the high level technique to back it up. Dominic Reyes is completely different, very technical, does everything the right way, correct technique, proper technique, he's just an excellent fighter. And one of the things that I love about Reyes is that even though he's six foot four with a massive 77 inch reach, he's a very tall guy, but he doesn't suffer from any of the problems that a lot of tall guys suffer from. You know, a lot of abnormally tall fighters for the division, for their division, you know, suffer from bad takedown defense, whereas Dominic Reyes is takedown defense, wrestling, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's it's excellent. Like Reyes is the total package. For me, out of all the guys coming up in the light heavyweight division, Reyes is the biggest threat to John Jones's title. You know, I don't think he could beat John Jones, but he's definitely the best guy in the division at the moment on the come up. So what I would say is I do expect Reyes to to just win this fight wherever it takes place. He can outstrike Vulcan. You know, he could knock Vulcan out and he can definitely take Vulcan down and out wrestle him. But what I would say, if we jump right into the odds on this fight, is my problem with this fight is the odds. If we look at the average odds available on Reyes at the moment, uh, are around about 1.38. That gives him an implied probability of 72%, which is tough because, again, like we spoke about in the Nathaniel Wood versus Jose Quinones fight in part one of this video, with Nathaniel Wood having a similar implied probability, these guys are better than their opponent everywhere. But to get any value, you have to cap them at 75 to 80 percent, which is a stretch because we know for all of Vulcan's weaknesses, you know, for all his weaknesses with cardio, for all his weaknesses with his ground game, um, for his lack of technique standing, you know, he's very scrappy. He does hit very hard. There's no denying it. So, you know, just this past weekend. We saw Tim Means. Tim Means, a guy that had never been KO'd in 40 pro fights, absolutely dominating the fight on the ground and standing up. And he gets flatlined, death shotted out of nowhere. And, you know, Tim Means had an implied probability of 65% going into that fight. You know, it was a bet I loved. You have to think when you start to go up the weight classes, you know, that fight was at welterweight. As you go up the weight classes, the chances of a flash knockout become significantly more likely because you're dealing with bigger guys that hit harder, that have more power. And we know Vulcan Ozdemir does have knockout power. He's not particularly technical, um, but he definitely hits very hard. There's no denying it. You know, he, he, he knocked out Manoa and Sirkinov, who, you know, yes, are a little bit chinny. This fight against Sirkinov, the KO win over Sirkinov, was literally the strangest KO I've ever seen in my life. But at the same time, you can see 
that when he does land on guys, you know, we saw it early in the Anthony Smith fight, early in the Daniel Cormier fight. When he does land on guys, he gets their respect and they don't like it and they don't want to be hit again. And that's a sign of a guy that does have power in his hands. And really, you know, Reyes is only only had 10 pro MMA fights, haven't really seen him fight a high level of opponent. You know, in his 10 pro fights, you know, only two of them have gone the distance with the other eight all ending in round one. So we haven't really seen him fight any big hitters. We, we haven't seen what his chin's like. We haven't seen what, what it, what, how he copes when he gets put into a bad position. And we do know that Ozdemir comes out very, very aggressively. So, you know, Reyes also doesn't have that much experience competing outside the United States. This is a big fight. This is on the main card, I believe. Is it on the main card? Yeah, this is on the main card of a big show in the UK. Remember, the O2 Arena in London is a very big arena. It holds about twenty to 25,000 people, depending on how they set the arena up, which is about double the capacity of the majority of uh, stadiums the UFC hold their events in. In America, you know, the average only holds ten to 15,000 people in the majority of stadiums where the UFC have their shows um, outside of Vegas. So, you know... There's a lot there's a lot of risk to this bet, even though Reyes is brilliant and he's 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 much better than, than Ozdemir everywhere. And with an implied probability of 72%, there's really not a lot of value there. So I would recommend passing on this fight, guys, because there's just the risk is not worth the reward, in my opinion. And let me show you what I mean. You know, I've seen a lot of people this week wanting to bet Darren Till, wanting to bet Nathaniel Wood, and wanting to bet on uh, also wanting to bet on, on uh, Dominic Reyes. And I can see why. Because these guys are better than the guys they're fighting. They do have the best chance of winning. But that also comes at a price, comes at a cost. You know, they're all steep favourites. If we look at it at the moment, if we just bring up a tax pad, I just want to show you the dangers of betting fighters at these odds. You know, if we were to bet the same amount on Darren Till and on Nathaniel Wood and on Dominic Reyes this weekend. Let me just show you what, what that means. So say we were to bet one uh, say we were to bet one hundred pounds or one hundred dollars on Darren Till. At the current odds, you know, average odds available are around about four uh what what uh 1.40 meaning that if he were to win you would get forty dollars profit. Okay. Then looking at Nathaniel Wood, uh, his odds currently have been smashed over the last couple of days. I'm guessing people throwing him into parlays and stuff. So the best odds you can get him at the moment around about you know 1.36. So if he won, you bet £100 on him, $100, you get $36 back. And then if we also now look at uh, Dominic Reyes, he's down to around about 1.38 on most sites, which means if you bet him, uh, you would get $38 back. Okay, so if... All the, if you bet on all these three guys to win this weekend, and they did all win, you would make, or you would make one hundred and fourteen dollars in profit, which means you'd only just double your money. Only do just double your money. Whereas if only two of these guys were to win, say Till won and say Wood won, you would only get back seventy six dollars in profit. Okay. Now if you bet obviously $100 on each, you would be down a little bit. You wouldn't even have broken even if just one of these guys were to were to win. Sorry, if one of these guys were to lose, you wouldn't even break even, okay? Now, if two of these guys were to lose, you would be at a very big loss. And if three of them were to lose, you would get absolutely wrecked. Do you see what I mean? So the point I'm trying to make with these kind of bets is you have to maintain a very, very big win rate in order to make money on these kind of bets. Because even if you're placing these bets and winning 66 66 percent to 70 percent of these bets even if you're winning you know two out of three of these bets you're only probably floating around break even which it really isn't a good return it is a lot of risk and then if you drop underneath that 66 percent winning rate and you're only winning you know 55 to 60 percent of them which is very realistic you know most professional gamblers can only float around the 67 percent win rate then you're going to be you're going to be losing money. So these bets are very dangerous. They're very tempting because when you look at them, you think you know a guy like Nathaniel Wood better than Quinones almost everywhere. He should win. I'll bet him. A guy like Dominic Reyes significantly better than Ozdemir everywhere. I'll bet him. But again, like we saw in the Tim Means fight, it only takes one punch to change a fight, and and these kind of losses happen. So that's the re reason why I would recommend passing on some of these fights. 
including Reyes versus Ozdemir, even though I think Reyes will win. Hopefully that illustration made sense. I know I can babble a little bit, but you just have to win a lot of them to make any money. And personally, I don't think the risk is worth the reward with these kinds of bets. When you bet on a guy at these sort of odds, they basically have to have almost no way to lose. They basically have to be like the Tim Means fight, where we saw Tim Means dominate everywhere. Nico Price isn't particularly dangerous. Um, you know, he does have a few KO wins, but against really low level guys, much lower level than Means. Means hasn't been KO'd in 40 pro fights, a so flash KO was unlikely. In those situations, you know, it's worth betting on guys at steep odds. Whereas we know Ozdemir hits very hard. Um, you know, we haven't really seen Reyes's chin tested. He's quite inexperienced. You don't know how he's going to react if he's put into a bad position. Only two of his 10 career fights have gone a distance. With, with Nathaniel Wood, we haven't really seen him fight a high-level wrestler, a strong wrestler, someone like Quinones, who can get that full body lock and play and drag him to the ground and take his back. We haven't seen him really defending chokes against high-level guys. You know, Darren Till, we don't know how his cardio is going to hold up. You get what I'm saying, guys. You get what I'm saying. There's a lot of risk to these kind of bets, even though they are tempting. So then the final fight that I want to talk about in today's video, if I go and pick my son up from school, so I need to get this one done quickly, is Mike Grundy against Nad Naramani. Now, Mike Grundy is the best British MMA grappler I have ever seen by a mile. He's fucking amazing he's amazing mike grundy's amazing he's just brilliant he is a former commonwealth games bronze medalist bronze medalist at freestyle wrestling he has also traveled the world to compete and train he spent a lot of time in russia in america honing his skills and he is also, in his younger days, when he was a teenager, he was trained by Ben Askren and Tyrone Woodley's wrestling coach for five to six years. And when you watch footage of Mike Grundy, as a British MMA fan, you know, it's no secret that the majority of British fighters, their biggest weakness is their takedown defense, their wrestling, their grappling. When you watch Mike Grundy, it's almost hard to believe that he's British because his grappling's just, I will say it, fucking amazing his grappling is fucking amazing in terms of technique he's competing in the featherweight division he is going to be one of the best wrestlers in the featherweight division no doubt about it in terms of technique we saw gregor gillespie come in with a traditional wrestling technique and blow through the lightweight division i'm not saying grundy's going to do that but he definitely has the technique to cause guys big problems. You see wrestlers at the moment like Alexander Volkanovsky rise to the top of the featherweight division very quickly. His next fight's against Jose Aldo. All I'm saying is, based on technique, guys like Grundy would could potentially cause Volkanovsky some issues once he's had a few fights in the UFC, once he's worked on his cardio conditioning and pacing, once he's got comfortable in the octagon. That's how good Mike Grundy's grappling is fucking amazing right well i i can talk about this blah 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 whatever i'm just going to show you how good his grappling is let's play his round one of his last fight against fernando bruno at aspera fc 58 now if you look at mike grundy's record you'll notice that he hasn't had that many fights and that's because he's at such a high level that no one on the european circuit wanted to fight him because he's such a strong wrestler he's a fucking nightmare so we have to go to countries like japan and countries like brazil to get fights so fernando bruno you may remember the name he was a ufc fighter he did compete on the ultimate fighter brazil picked up some wins uh, or picked up a win against nazarino malagari who uh, who is still a ufc fighter and also, um, he trains at Nova Uniao, and you've never seen uh, a Nova Uniao fighter with bad takedown defense or a bad ground game. This guy, uh, Fernando Bruno, trains with Jose Aldo, Hacker and Diaz every day of the week. So you know, this guy is no joke. He's no bum. And Grundy went over to Brazil to fight him in his own country. And this is round one, guys. And there's no specific things that I really want to talk about from Grundy's performance. I want to just fucking talk about all of it. Because everything he does is brilliant. Obviously, his striking's a bit... It needs work. Not terrible, but it needs work. But when he goes to his wrestling, he's fucking good. 
And it doesn't take him long to get his fight to the ground. So he throws some flim flam. The flying knees really just to open up the, the opportunity to get his opponent down. And look at him. Just throws Bruno to the ground. When have you ever seen Nova Unyao Nova guys get tossed to the ground like this? Brilliant stuff. I'm going to not pause this. as I'm not going to pause this. I'm just going to leave it running. Just talk you through some of the things that make makes Gwendy so good and then I'm going to go pick my son up from school so we're going to get this done fast but he just tosses Bruno to the ground straight into side control now one thing that you'll notice about Mike Gwendy that I absolutely love is that his, he just stays very heavy on top of his opponents he doesn't give them any space to improve, his posi to improve their position and he always goes for position over submission like you see from these high level guys like Gregor Gillespie steps over and takes the mount here ties up Bruno's legs, controls Bruno's arms so it makes it difficult for Bruno to defend himself and try and post his arm and start to use the cage to stand back up a technique the Nova Uniel fighters are excellent at doing. But look at this, Khabib Nurmagomedov style. As soon as Fernando Bruno starts to work his way back to the feet, Grundy does not let him do it. It's brilliant. He goes, take, he, he moves the Fernando's back from mount and drags him to the ground. A lot of guys would have just stayed in mount and given up that position. I've got to rewind a little bit because here, notice how as Bruno was about to start, use the cage to stand back up. I, I've got to pause it a little bit, guys, because it's all happening fast. But it's brilliant what Grundy does. As Bruno starts to use the cage to stand back up, Notice how Grundy gets a hook in with his right leg, or his left leg, sorry, and then takes Fernando's back. And then look, instead of staying, this is again, this i I got to stop pausing, guys, otherwise this video is going to be long. But another brilliant thing that Grundy does here is that he only had one hook in. If he would have stayed in that back control position, Fernando Bruno could have exploded in the top position. But Grundy realises that and he doesn't give it to him. So instantly, he uses the arm to prevent Bruno from exploding in the top position. Look how he gets his left arm across the neck of Bruno here. And instead, he just takes top position back straight into half guard. And his hips are so heavy. His top control is so strong. I can't believe that a British fighter is this good on the ground all these little nuances all these tiny little details all these like it's just fucking perfect he's fucking perfect on the ground it's amazing it is amazing and i'm going to leave this running in the background right while i wrap this fight up just so you can appreciate all I need to stop looking at it though. I need to stop looking or I'm going to keep saying amazing things Grundy's doing. And I need to wrap this uh, this bet into a bet. But trust me, Grundy is f fucking legit on the ground. And that's interesting because Nad Naramani is also a grappler. Okay? So even though there's no doubt that Naramani has a significant advantage when it comes to striking, Grundy, you know, Commonwealth Games level, free... Uh, bron Commonwealth Games level bronze medalist, freestyle wrestling, trained all over the world, competed all over the world, trained by Askren and Woodley's coaches from uh, coach from Missouri. He's the real deal. He has the skills to dictate where this fight takes place. He should be able to take Naramani down and dictate where this fight, fight takes place and control him from top position. And based on this fight, he's got the cardio to back it up. Grundy's got the cardio to fight at a high pace for, for 15 minutes. Just look at that, how he kept hold of the body lock. Look how he kept hold of the body lock. Doesn't let go of his control. Doesn't let go of his opponent's body. Doesn't give them any room. He's just brilliant. He's just brilliant. Grundy's just brilliant. Anyway, moving on. So, if we look at the uh, look into this fight. So, yes, Naramani is a better striker, no doubt about it. But Grundy is light years ahead of him when it comes to grappling. Which is interesting because, like I say, he should be able to dictate where the fight takes place. Now, if we get rid of this and look at the odds for this fight, we can see that at the moment, um, Mike Grundy's odds uh, around about two. Well, the best you can get at the moment is two point four to two point five zero. So he's still at two point five zero on a lot of British websites. So he has actually declined literally since I started doing the video. Before I started doing the video, he was two point five everywhere. Now he's down to 2.35 on the, some of the American sites, 2.50-ish on the British sites, which is William Hill, um, Pinnacles, Canadian, Australia, 
um, Scandinavia, Scandinavia, some European uh, website, some European countries can also bet a pinnacle. So if we look at the current implied probability, so the implied probability on Mike Grundy is currently 43%, and the current implied probability on uh, Nad Naramani, his odds currently floating around about 1.61 which gives him an implied probability of 62%. Uh, now, what I will say is, obviously, the majority of you that watch these videos is from Europe. Uh, and when I checked the odds earlier on today on an odds comparison site for Europe, Grendy was much better odds than 2.35. So I just want to check where he's at at the moment. Uh, if we bring the odds comparison up here, so we can see that on a lot of websites, Grundy is still at 2.50 or better. 2.50 on Skybet, 2.62 Betfair, 2.50 William Hill, 3.0 Coral, which is a major betting website, 2.62 Paddy Power. So a lot of the major European sites have still got Grundy at much better odds than what the American sites have listed him at. So if we just popped in an average of 2.50, that gives him an implied probability of 40% which is interesting because he has the skills to dictate where this fight takes place now what i would say is when you go back and watch the fights of both these guys um we obviously haven't seen naramani uh face much resistance when it comes to his wrestling his last two fights against anderson dos santos and khalid taha who are both strikers but if you go back and watch his fights against daniel raquilio and Paddy Pimblett, you will see massive holes in the, in Naramani's grappling, which Grundy should be able to exploit, and Grundy should be able to take Naramani down and dominate him based on these two fights. The only thing that concerns me here, and a big risk factor here, is that Nad Naramani, since the Pimblett fight, has been training at Team Alpha Male. You know, here you can see him, he's been training full-time at Team Alpha Male for a long time, and there is obviously no better gym in the world to prepare for a grappler than to go to Team Alpha Male. So we would expect to see Naramani have made big improvements to his grappling since he fought uh, Paddy, Plimba, Paddy Pimbler almost exactly two years ago. Obviously, other risk factors to throw into the mix. Uh, Mike Grundy is making his UFC debut. Doesn't have a lot of experience. You know, most of the guys he fought have been a really low level. You know, this guy is losing record. This guy looked like he made his pro debut. So hasn't really faced that high level of a higher level of opponent but he has had a problem getting fights um what can i say like i say i don't like to bet on guys making the ufc debut i really don't octagon jitters are a real thing um and he hasn't fought in 18 months either because he's been struggling to get fights and ring rest is a real thing but it's very tempting it is very tempting guys with an implied probability of 40%. When you consider that Naramani is not a particularly dangerous striker, even though he does have an advantage when it comes to striking, there's no doubt about it. When you also take into consideration the fact that Mike Grundy trains at Team Calbana, predominantly striking based gym, he's going to be dealing, he's going to be, you know, drilling and practicing and sparring with better strikers every day than that Naramani. You know, Grundy has said that, that he, he, he spars with Darren Till. You know, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is this is one of those bets, guys, like the Veronica Mikado bet from a few weeks ago, where there is a lot of risk. It's not, it's not, it's not the best of circumstances to be betting on a fight and making their UFC debut because of octagon jitters. They may adrenaline dump early. They may not pace themselves. It's also not ideal to bet on someone that hasn't fought in 18 months. But when you look at how good Grundy is, when you take into account that both these guys are primarily grapplers and the fact that Grundy should have the skills to dictate where this fight takes place, you know, at these odds, if you can get him a round about 2.50, he is still 2.50 on a large number of betting websites. You know, at worst, I would cap this fight at 50-50, you know? If we knew that Grundy was going to show up and perform like he did you know, when he fought Fernando Bruno, and if we thought Naramani was going to show up and perform like he did against Pimblet, you know, I would cap Grundy at six, a 60 to 70 percent chance of winning this fight. And it's very possible Naramani may show up looking like that. And it's very possible that Grundy will show up looking even better than Bruno than he did against Bruno. This is his UFC debut. He's probably been printing the training camp of his life for this. 
So I would consider betting on Grundy, guys. I really would. It's a it's a gamble. Like I see you guys in the comments when I recommend these type of bets that are gambles. I see you cry when they lose. Like babies, you just don't like losing. But you have to understand when there's value. And in my opinion, Naramani hasn't shown anything really, which means that he should be the favourite in this fight. You know, if we look at his odds, you know, around about 1.65 giving him an implied probability of 61%. What has Naramani done to deserve having a, being capped as a 61% favourite in a fight against a Commonwealth Games bronze medalist in freestyle wrestling that's trained over the world, all, all, over, all over the world? You know, I understand Naramani's been training at Team Alpha Male for two years, but is that going to make up for a lifetime of, of competitive grappling for Grendy? You know, I don't think it is. But you have to make your own decision based on the information I've presented here today, based on your own research. I think at around about 2.50, Grundy's a decent bet. And you can get him at those odds on a lot of websites. So you make your own mind up, guys. But he's fucking good on the ground. He's a very good grappler. And Naramani's also a grappler. And I can tell you for free, if you go watch Naramani's fight against Pimblet and any of Grundy's recent fights, you'll see the level of difference in grappling it's just light years apart so that is it for today's video guys that is it for part two i hope you enjoyed it if you want to see me do that live stream video uh, this saturday at 1 p.m british time you can set a reminder if you go onto my channel page you can set a reminder now or work out what time it is in your time zone if you want to see that video hit the thumbs up and below and if every video i put out this week gets 50 likes i will do that and to help us reach that target guys please share this video in any forums you post in Please share it on your social media pages if you like it and all that kind of good stuff. But I will see you guys tomorrow with part three.